be presenting you during the next one and a half hour what we managed to put together for, for all of you. Um, Minority Rights Group is 54 years old organization working with and for ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities all over the world. And every year we uh, publish a minority and indigenous trend report. Every year we decide about different main theme of the report. Um, it's, not, um, it's not a random decision. We are always consulting it with a lot of our partners, with a lot of our friends from different corners of the world. And this year, the decision was taken to talk about water. Water in connection with life of different minority groups, with very different aspects of it. Um, very soon, I will give floor to my colleague, uh, Nicolas, who will present the report, who will tell you about all the different chapters and all the different angles. He will explain why did we take such a decision and why did we divide the report in this way? Uh, and I will ask you, all of you out there, I know that people from very different locations are joining us, to think about our report as an inspiration, to think also about what is happening around you. Uh, in our report, we have case studies from around 30 countries of the world. Um, as we all know, there is more countries in this world. There is close to 200 countries in this world. But of course, we are not able to put stories from each country and each region. So please look at it as an inspiration. Please think about your own neighborhood, your own country, minority groups from your own countries, and think if those topics are touching them too. I'm quite sure that most of those topics uh, could be also discussed in your country. So please think about it this way. Mm. On our Facebook Live, uh, you are able to comment, you are able to ask questions. Please feel free to do it. I will be trying to watch it happening. And after the presentations of our speakers, we will come back to your questions or doubts or suggestions maybe for us. Um, thank you very much for being here. Um, and well, I give floor to uh, Nicolas Salazar Sutit our uh, commissioning editor and the person who knows the report from the beginning till the end with every sentence. Uh, Nicolas, tell us more. What did we put in there this year? Thank you so much, Anna, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for the time you're giving me to speak and for the um, attention and interest in our work. And thank you to our speakers for also being here and taking time off to share their stories with us. Thank you, Anne Polina. Thank you, Sumertai Arkin. Thank you, Merciete. Thank you, Ola Antilaba, for your time. And thank you to everyone else who contributed as authors to this report or as interviewees or as photographers or as content developers. And of course, thank you to this report or team. as thank you to uh, Miriam Lawson, to Carl Soderberg, um, to um, Samra Witkogs, I can't even pronounce the, the, the names of my colleagues. Uh, thank you, everyone. I feel really quite humbled to, to stand here and introduce this to you because uh, I'm in no position to, to really speak on behalf of anyone or to even begin to explain what we're trying to do anyone um, or to as far as uh, even begin to explain what we're trying to do anyone or to as far as even begin to explain what we're trying to do anyone or to as far as even begin to explain what up or or convey or represent this report is a uh, forgive me for the bad pun but a tip in the iceberg of a, a, a problem or a, or, a, or a challenge or a, a journey to transformation that is much, much bigger than what you see in this report. Um, but on the basis of what we've put together, which are 35 case studies from around the world and three in-depth chapters, it is clear that we are facing an existential threat and that the people who are most at risk of this existential threat are the indigenous peoples of this world who, are, who live in closest proximity, not just to physical water, but to the culture and the societal 
understanding of water as part of uh, our own bodies and our own um, our own uh, social living. Uh, minorities and indigenous peoples are facing um, a whole array of different, very complex issues and dilemmas that we've tried to convey to you in this report. And I will say a, a word or two just about that structure of the report, um, a, a little bit about the thinking of the report, and then I'm, I'm really keen just to give the space to our speakers because really um, it, is, it is their voices that, that matter. Um, so, with your permission, I'm just going to share my screen and I'm going to show you a little bit of the report just to get you get a flavor of what this is and why you may find interesting um, contents in it. Um, I, I imagine that Miriam is going to say a word or two about the story behind this photograph. We, for the first time, did a photo competition for uh, photographers who identify either as indigenous or members of a minority group, and this is the winning photograph. Uh, Miriam, you can say more about that. Um, so first of all, the coverage. I, I, I tend not to like these sort of mappings. I find them very colonial and a, a gross mis misrepresentation of what we're trying to do. Uh, so forgive me if this really is very, very... Um, generalistic and, 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 and in a way a misrepresentation because these are stories of people and place really. Really. And, 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 um, over and, and above in a way a misrepresentation because here, these are stories of, stories of people and real place people real and, 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 and just so um, you get over and above in a way, where these stories are again in a very general way we've put this map together we didn't we didn't find any other way of, of conveying that so unfortunately we work with this standardized idea of, of maps and countries but we are aware that we're not dealing with countries. We're dealing with nations, we're dealing with people, and we're dealing with a planetary uh, issue. Water is a cycle that connects the entire planet through the motions of water in air, in the air, in ocean currents, through surface, groundwater, salt water. It's a planetary connection, and it's very difficult to convey that. But just so you get a sense, we have three chapters. A chapter from... The Kimberleys and Polina will share a little bit about her story in what is known as Australia. So we've highlighted Australia there. Uh, we have a story from Finland, uh, which is highlight that highlighted there as well. Ola and Tilaba will share the perspective of the Sami people and, and the water story there. And all the various other countries, again, we have individual stories from members of particular communities. Um, overall, so you get a sense, uh, th this is really a, a, a cross-national and planetary uh, debate. And the only way really to address water is as such, as a hydrological cycle, something that connects us all, something that involves us all, and something that matters to all of us. And part of the reflection that we, we get out of this report is that currently our systems of governance, of law, our political and economic systems operate at national interest level or at international interest level which serves the purposes and interests of nations or countries rather but it, we're not looking at water as this planetary element that connects us all and there's a massive failure in our systems of law a massive failure in our political and economic systems in understanding law in understanding water as water and there's great great insight in the indigenous perspectives that, that have come together in, in this volume in offering ways to understand water as water. And I hope that Ampolina especially can say something about that uh, because that's very, very to understand water as water in her chapter. Water. Um, and I hope that Ampolina especially can... I'm just going to flick through the pages. Um, you get a sense of the aesthetics of, of, of the report. It's divided into this first section where we have three chapters uh, and the the structure of this is we start with people uh, process and planet to try and move from those very um, place-based very earth-centered perspectives and Ampolinas is the opener in this sense through to process through to planet how can we move from real places to planetary change that's that's the sort of shape of these opening chapters. So we'll begin with Anne, and I'm, I'm going to give the floor to Anne in a second. Bear with me. 
Um, then we have a chapter on the historical way in which water was turned into essentially a commodity, a thing, through a colonial history of water governance in Europe, which I think is very important because this framework, this understanding of water as a thing, a commodity, uh, a monetary value, has through um, colonial and imperialistic forces being spread globally. And many, many of the problems from Chile to China have to do with these forms of governance of water that don't respect water, really. They don't see reciprocity with water and don't understand the indigenous peoples who live with water. And this is a Eurocentric framework. So this chapter, I think, is very important in terms of understanding that process whereby we lost a sense of what water truly is. Um, and the third chapter has to do with planetary uh, dilemmas. So we're looking at landlocked countries across Central Asia and, and North Central Africa, where distance from the sea for many of these countries have caused and exacerbated water problems. So we see across large swathes of the planet, many, many nations, many peoples are facing exactly the same dilemmas, i.e. water scarcity, lack of access, pollution, etc. So we have a planetary perspective. Um, then we have 35 case studies, as you saw in the map earlier, from different parts of the world, um, addressing the themes that we thought were uh, most poignant in terms of understanding what is often called the water crisis, although it's not a, a water crisis, but more of a need to transform our understanding of water. And these were the 10 areas where we believe transformation is most urgent in terms of achieving what we believe is the kernel of this, which is justice, water for, for all. We're all made of water and we all have rights to water. Um, how do we uh, achieve a human rights-based approach to water law and water governance. Uh, here are the 10 themes that we think need to be highlighted. There needs, there, there needs to be a, a fairness and equality in terms of water access, which is the first theme. Um, there needs to be fairness and um, equality in terms of sanitation, the right for people and community to have a healthy and um, clean, hygienic, uh, source and use of water. Pollution, we're looking at major instances of pollution around the world, including the ongoing pollution crisis in the Niger Delta in Nigeria. And Mercieta, Dr. Mercieta will tell us a little bit about that in a second. I am really, really honored that we've had some sort of minor inputs in terms of reviving the memory of Ken Sarawiwa in this report because I think he is really a luminary, a, a, a figure, an iconic figure in terms of defending the rights of indigenous peoples to water and defending the indigenous rights of people to live in a world that is not polluted <coughs> and where people can have a future and inherit a land. The fourth theme is floods, and this was really important, we felt, because uh, 2022 was a year of unprecedented floods in the subcontinent, in Bangladesh, India, and especially in Pakistan. All that is covered in this report. There were devastating floods all across Africa, which didn't appear in the news, but were more costly and deadlier than the Pakistan floods. And of course, there were deadly floods in Australia during 2022, including in the Pacific, so-called Pacific territories of Australia and in the Pacific islands, um, which have caused existential threat to many Pacific islanders. Their stories are also included in this report. Um, we've covered drought, and that is another major event of 2022, unprecedented wide-scale and catastrophic droughts all around the world, including where I come from, in Chile. Uh, we've covered the story of the Petorca water crisis, which is very close to my, my heart. I've seen that firsthand. Um, and also in southern parts of Africa, Namibia and Madagascar, they're covered in, in this report. Um, we've also looked at infrastructure and the role played by large um, industrial and mass scale infrastructure, especially dams, canals and systems of irrigation that um, are used by state powers to essentially control territories to generate power, electricity and energy, but also power in a political sense to control the um, geopolitical uh, conditions of a certain territory, and that's uh, 
really important in terms of an understanding of, of conflict. So the infrastructure and conflict sections go hand in hand. And I think uh, in terms of really poignant stories, this is a story that, of the Uyghur minority group in China. And I'm very happy that Sumertai Arkin is here to tell us a little bit more about that particular story. Other stories contained in this section of the report include the Gerd Dam in Ethiopia, which I think is also a major story of infrastructure and conflict affecting uh, several countries in, in, in the upstream regions of, of the uh, Nile Delta. And the final three sections of our report, and I will finish here, um, sorry if I've taken a bit too long, are usage, where we have stories from Iran, um, Ch uh, China, and Chile. We have um, the theme of governance, where we're looking at indigenous ways of governing and, uh, and maintaining water systems. And finally, we've got a, a closing chapter on culture and biocultural rights, where we have included stories from uh, Vanuatu, Colombia, and, and, and the UK. Um, and just to finish off, I mean, there are many, many insights coming from this, um, the, this report, um, many wisdoms and many takeaways. But one of them, um, and I will finish here, is that these so-called solutions to the water crisis are right in front of us. Indigenous peoples have developed um, systems of, of water keeping, water guardianship for hundreds, thousands, if not tens, tens of thousands of years. And the water crisis is amongst other things, a colonial enterprise to continue to undermine and destroy those systems of knowledge, of water knowledge and water keeping. And throughout this report, you will see that in practically every one of these stories, there are existing traditions of, uh, of water maintenance and water conservancy that people have used in, in their lands for a long time and have achieved a sustainable and fair way of living with and as water. And those knowledges, those uh, wisdoms are being undermined and destroyed by a system that persists in the mad understanding of water as money. Um, so I think I will finish there for now. Uh, I will pass the floor back to, um, to Anna, who is leading us through. So thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions later on about the shape of this report if need be. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And well, thank you for putting all of this together. A big, big, big job is done. Now we can we can enjoy the report. Um, I would like now to invite our four speakers and authors uh, to bring us a little bit closer to to your own stories, your own chapters. Um, we have with us Anne Polina, who is joining us from well far for me far. Um, what time is it for you, Anne? I think it's 7 p.m. It's, you know, this is this is the, the, the beauty of Internet, that we can be still in this Zoom room together, even if it would be really difficult to, to, to manage with all of us. Thank you for joining. Thank you for taking uh, your time, giving us your time. And um, please uh, tell us a bit more about who you are, where you are. And what did you write in your chapter? Don't tell them everything because we want them to go to the report and read it. Um, but please, the Zoom floor is yours. Yeah. Mabung Bayan, Najinu Nilawala and Polina, Nayu Imaruaraman, and Nai Mandajara Nigan, and Nai Nigan and Nanga, Nai Nanga in Alice Springs on Aranda land. Uh, in my language, I said, um, good evening. My name is Anne Paulina, and I'm a woman who belongs to the Fitzroy River, the Marawara, our river. And I'm speaking to you tonight from Aranda country in Alice Springs, not far from Uluru, the big rock. So um, thank you for the opportunity to write a story, um, particularly being able to tell our story our way. Um, the title of my story was called Just Us for All, and that this Indigenous wisdom is for humanity and planetary well-being. And it is a gift that's coming from Indigenous people, and I can't understand why it's so difficult for the world to realise with climate change and climate chaos, who would you not come to than the holders of the oldest knowledge 
on the planet. Um, it's not an ego thing, but my people have been here from the beginning of time. We've got records of 60,000, 100,000 years occupation. We formed the first water industry. We have been managing these systems. When I talk about my river, our river, it, we call it the river of life because it is life. It gives us life. It created our identity. We are the river. So it's a very important story because as I travel the globe and I've stopped doing that now, um, uh, very few people actually understood that there are First Nations people, first people in Australia, which is us Indigenous people. And as colonised people, we see ourselves as sovereign people, people who are citizens of our independent nations that go right across the land. Um, I come from a culture where we hold first law, law of the land, not law of man. And these laws teach us how to be a good ancestor, how to be a good and decent human beings in deep relationship with our river system. Rivers are amazing. They are a living systems. We see our river as a living ancestral serpent being. We cry with it. We dance with it. We sing with it. We think all of these things and we dream with it. So we have a very deep relationship with this river from the beginning of time. When I talk about first law, I talk about values. I talk about ethics. I talk about virtues. How did we as Indigenous people in Australia self-regulate our behaviour? How did we come up with these um, ways that we would have a moral obligation to living systems around us? When we are born, we are given a totem. It could be an animal, it could be a bird, it could be an insect. But this creature can teach us how to be a good and decent human being, and we are bonded to that for life. So I am bonded to a blue-tongued lizard, but I am also bonded to our river because, as I said, rivers are living systems. They hold memory. And it's very, very important that we continue to nurture this ability for it to, you know, do what it needs to do. Um, I was looking at um, the work in New Zealand with Māori people, how they had named the Wanganui the Whanganui and had got personhood. And I came back to the other elders and I said to them, do you realise a river in New Zealand has got personhood? And the other elders looked at me as if I was from a different planet. And they said, when I talked about our river, e not a human being. The river is not a human being. It is an ancestral being. So a lot of the work that I'm writing about in terms of looking at first law and where that sits with colonial law is to say that we have a law that governs that this system must, as a river, have not only um, a right to live, but a right to flow. So much of that work now is looking at how do we bring a story in regards to showing that rivers are living systems, they are ancestral beings to us, and they are in deep relationship. So when I talk about first law, it is very much um, around the codes of what we have agreed to as Indigenous people. It's all about relationship. How do we have this deep and meaningful relationship that we are born into as Indigenous people? How do we see and feel the world a different way, particularly in terms of listening to rivers and what rivers are saying to human beings? And as Nicola shared, rivers are the umbilical cords. They connect us from a planetary level and they connect through the seas and through the oceans, through the rivers. We call rivers and the waterways living water systems. They are living water because they are alive. So when we talk about it, it's very much about relationship. It's very much about respect, about treating the river system, treating multi-species, the birds, the trees, the wind, with deep respect because they are our kin, we are connected. How do we then have a sense of reciprocity? How do we grow this ethics of care and this duty of love that we must look after nature? Because we as Indigenous people, we have not walked away from what we call the Garden of Eden. We have stayed, we have nurtured it, we have loved it, we have cared for it from the beginning of time. And we still do that under much and deep uh, pressure and much pain. Um, so with reciprocity, how do we build that ethics of care? With reciprocity also comes responsibility. We have a duty of care as Indigenous people to ensure our living river is here, not just now, but for generations to come. So it's very, very important that we hold all of these things together. 
I believe Indigenous people do hold the solutions for planetary health and well-being. We have guarded these last bastions of biodiversity around the world, and these are the last bastions that hold the life support systems of the planet. If we continue to destroy that, we will destroy humanity. And so what we're saying is that listen, listen to this wisdom. We are gifting it to you with love, with care, because we see you as fellow human beings. We want to ensure that young people not born yet can dream and be in a world that is beautiful and powerful and is not polluted and corrupted and all about the politics of economics. So we are realistic people. We live in a world where we're saying that we need to unite. We are dealing with complexity. We need collective wisdom. We need all of us to be at the table. It cannot be about ego. It has to be about the ecosystem, about nature, about these living water systems. Um, I live in a country where we are currently having a debate about whether or not my people should be written into the Australian Constitution. So this is time where we have to say, wake up the snake. When we say wake up the consciousness of the people, that's what we mean by wake up the snake. How do we wake up the people to bring the people with us? Because we are seeing country changing and yet the demands by multinational companies on our nation states is vicious and it is destroying our well-being, our world, but not just our world, but the public interest of all who live in our regions. And so what we're saying is climate change is real, climate chaos is real, and unless we come and have this dialogue with Indigenous people and decolonise our thinking, we cannot unite and live in a pluriverse together. So it's very, very important that we do this. We care about it. We care for each other because I believe the wisdom we hold will give the planet and humanity a climate chance. So what we're saying is that the wisdom that we're wanting to share from our um, stories of first law is really to look at governance from a regional, bioregional perspective. Biocultural governance must lead this. It must be bioregionally based. And we must stand together and show that we can create the new economies which don't result in the destruction of our river systems, our lives, our people, Indigenous and not. And so what I'm saying is that this is a story that has allowed me to, one, tell the history of my people, tell the history of colonialism in this country, but say that we are walking together as human beings. It is a privilege to be a human being, to think, to reason, to see with what we say our ears and listen with our eyes. So it's a very interesting paper. I hope to share this with many people. The elders are waiting to see the, the paper and, and sit by the riverbank and look at this, but rivers are asking the question, what are the humans doing? What do the humans intend to do? Gali Omabu, thank you for sharing. Thank you so much, Anna. You are such an inspiration. Uh, I'm sure not only for me, but for all of us. Um, I would like to invite everybody to go to our website and to, to read the chapter uh, written by Anne. Um, for those who joined us a bit later, I just wanted to tell you that we are just launching our, our fresh report, Minority and Indigenous Trends on Water. We were just in Australia. Now we will fly very, very fast uh, to China. I would like to give the Zoom floor to Zumbretai Arkin, who is the chair of Women's Committee at the World Uyghur Congress. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, and I think it's very hard to follow up after the brilliant presentation by Anna. So thank you so much for that as well. Um, my name is Zumbretai Arkin. I am Uyghur, um, but um, born and raised in um, Urumqi, um, East Turkestan, um, the region which is officially called the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region of China, but Uyghurs refer to it as East Turkestan. Um, Uyghurs, they also don't consider themselves as a minority because they consider themselves also the owners of their own homeland. Um, the story that I'm going to tell you today is a story of colonization um, and also conflict and how this has had a huge impact on our access to water as well. When I was first approached by Nicola, um, I was a bit apprehensive about the, I, the idea of writing on water because it has 
never occurred to me to write on that topic, but also to really think about that. Um, and then I took a, you know, some time to think really about it because I know that water it ha plays a you know really important role in our, our culture um, because actually our region is the furthest, the most remote area from the sea. So it's we have, you know, our our region is located um, between Tibet and uh, Mongolia, and um, it's in the northwest of China. So it's the furthest uh, to to from from the sea in the world. Um, so growing up in Urumqi, um, I was always fascinated by water as well because it was just never enough um, in terms of, you know, uh, when we went to, for example, the beach, it always seemed so far and it always seemed such a unique moments because it was difficult to find places like, like that. Um, so knowing that water was very important and very rare, um, it was something I thought it was important to talk about, um, especially um, in the context of today's um, oppression um, and our people. Um, just to also clarify that in the Uyghur people or the region was occupied by the Chinese Communist Party in 1949. So we have been officially colonized in 1949 and also labeled as an autonomous region in 1955. Um, and since the government, um, they've proclaimed or they've uh, guaranteed autonomy for the Uyghur people to manage themselves, to manage their own resources and everything they have. Um, we have since then never seen real autonomy. And this has led, of course, to many, many abuses, to many policies based on, you know, discrimination um, and which today has led to a genocide. Um, the Uyghur um, region or East Turkestan that we call um, is a very rich land. Um, it has um, various landscapes uh, from, you know, mountain ranges to also Taklamakan Desert and um, others. But it's also, um, it borders uh, Mongolia to the east, Russia to the north, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India to the west, and of course, Tibet to the south. So it has a, a very um, diverse uh, geography um, and history as well. Um, I think it makes sense to give a little bit of um, context of the oppressive system that we have uh, since 2013-14, um, just because I think it's going to give a better understanding and also um, comprehensive analysis on how it has impacted our access to it as well. Um, I think you you might most of you might have heard about the situation in in recent years because it's made of course the headlines in international newspapers but also um it's taken um the attention of the international community since the a few, a past few years but you really come down to Jinping coming to power in 2013 when he also was a, he became really the man in power in China um, he, with his arrival to power, he launched the uh, Strike Hard campaign against violent terrorism in May 2014, which really started, um, you know, a series of discriminatory policies, particularly mass arbitrary detentions uh, targeting Uyghurs, but also other Turkic Muslims um, in, in the region in, in the name of national security. Uh, which is also familiar because we hear it, for example, in Hong Kong, but also Tibet and uh, elsewhere, uh, but also mainly in the name of countering terrorism, which, of course, happened after 9-11 as well. So the purpose of this campaign was to really combat um, ethnic separatism, violent terrorism and religious extremism. And and in addition to the appointment of Chen Chuanggu as party secretary to the region um, in 2016, that also marked another escalation in the repression uh, because this governor, uh, this um, party secretary really turned the region into an open air prison. Um, he was previously appointed to, to Tibet and he completely transformed Tibet by transforming the Tibetan region into all 
also an open air prison because he incorporated a lot of high tech surveillance methods um, in our region. He developed a system for control using new technologies. So there were other officials together with him. They've put in place um, a, measure, a series of measures and policies that led to the systematic discrimination of Uyghurs um, through surveillance technology. Um, they've also uh, came up with a centralized um, system that's called Integrated Joint Operations Platform, which is an app that collects uh, personal information. Um, and there were also, of course, digital surveillance methods that were also supplemented by biometric data, including DNA and blood types that were collected from millions of people in the region without their uh, full and uh, free consent which were all sent to a, a central database where this in, uh, this um, uh, information was analyzed and then people, Uyghur people, were targeted. Um, of course, um, in re recent years, we've heard about the mass internment and arbitrary detention of at least um, three millions of Uyghurs and Turkic people in camps uh, that the government calls re-education camps. And these people are still in there. I have already of my relatives who have disappeared since 2016 and who are also um, for some in, in these camps who, you know, are held against their will, forced to undergo indoctrination, um, brainwashing, and various forms of torture inside these camps. Um, and this is all because um, of their ethnic and religious identity. These people haven't actually committed crimes, but the Chinese government has held them in these uh, conditions, um, extra legal detention uh, with no legal representation um, throughout the whole process, um, just for belonging to an ethnic and religious group. Um, so this gives you a little bit of context in terms of understanding the political situation right now. Um, and as I said in, in the beginning of my presentation, um, water has always been fundamental in our traditions um, because uh, the, the region is a landlocked um, region. The, the access to water has been very limited. But it doesn't mean that, of course, we don't have it. We have, you know, we're we're surrounded by mountains and we also have um, uh, different rivers um, as well. And um, in in the in the in the southern regions, the climate is very arid. Um, so it's extremely important. Um, so I guess recent challenges that, um, you know, uh, recent challenges. Challenges in when it comes to access to water result from climate change, spe specifically from the melting of glaciers, but also the development projects in water intensive industries uh, that came with the colonization, with the colonial power, and um, that put in danger our access to water. So in the 50s, um, the Xinjiang Production Construction Corps, or um, XPCC, or in, in uh, Chinese called Bingtuan, which is a paramilitary uh, result group. from climate change, um, spe that specifically is from the melting of various industries and also for the agricultural um, industry. It became, in the 1990s, um, a very important um, body in the region because um, they were the ones responsible for development and projects. And um, the the region became one of the world's most important textile producers and exporters, especially in the water intensive cotton industry. Um, and the XPCC or the Bingtuan operates autonomously from the government in the region um, and really monopolizes the cotton industry. So today um, they're also producing a lot of cotton and um, in the cotton industry, there is, um, you know, also the, the widespread presence of forced labor. So Uyghur forced labor is extremely present in the cotton industry, which is uh, monopolized by XPCC. And the region accounts for over 20% of the world's production of cotton. And that accounts for 80, approximately 84% of China's cotton. So you can understand that this industry requires a lot of water. So a lot of the water has gone into that, um, into that industry. And then in the, in you know in that context comes also the Karas system. The Karas system um, is a traditional Uyghur uh, network of underground channels 
channels um, that transport water down the tomb from uh, the Tangertach um, mountain range. And this is a very ancient, it's 2,000 year old ancient and uh, dog irrigation system um, that was built by uh, pastoralists in the region uh, for the irrigation of um, crops and also to prevent evaporation in very arid areas um, and th that also served as a drainage system and it used to be a very vast system um, with over 5,000 kilometers of water channels but unfortunately in the last 20 years um, the number of carouses in the region have uh, they decreased significantly mainly because of the and oil exploration and industrial scale farming so water channels um uh, have fallen into this use because of uh, not only climate change, but also because of these uh, development projects and um, uh, industrial scale farming. And um, based on the government's uh, figures, the cars went down from uh, 1,800 in the 50s to over um, just over 200 today. So it's also, um, if you look at the years, um, of decrease, this also coincides with the presence of XPCC in the region. And this carous system is actually extremely important for the Uyghur people because it has also, um, it, it is part of our heritage. And um, it's, it's especially for the elders, they talk about it as something, you know, that's fundamentally Uyghur and that's something that they're extremely proud of. But unfortunately, the Chinese government is also attempting to rewrite the history and um, claim that this is part of Chinese culture and that this was introduced by Chinese uh, people. Um, and in in line with that, the Chinese government has inscribed the Kairos system into the UNESCO um, heritage list, intangible uh, tentative list, um, but uh, claiming that this is, you know, part of the Chinese history. However, it's not. Um, and the Chinese government is trying to uh, change the historical narrative of the region, uh, of the Uyghur people and the, and the history. And this is something that really must be fought against. Um, and I think just lastly, I want to also stress the fact that, um, you know, international institutions, uh, multinationals have also play, um, you know, they play a role in, in that as well, because recent research has also indicated that um, through the um, loans of the World Bank, so through the loaning uh, arm of the World Bank, the International Finance Corporation, Chinese companies are building lead factories on top of these carous systems, which are, of course, destroying um, the, this, this whole system because it's also um, it's also polluting the water that's um, that's used by the local people for their crops, but also for uh, different uses. Um, and this has been documented by uh, different researchers and, and, and uh, the. the you know, institutions like the World Bank um, are actually helping this. Um, and although they have, uh, you know, proof at hand that this is happening, they're not doing uh, much. So I think this is something that must be discussed. And I think um, locals also should be included in, 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 in decisions that are affecting their livelihoods, especially when it comes to destroying such... Um, such a rich tradition and and her uh, something that's part of the Uyghur heritage, um, and um, I, I think it also indicates how colonial powers have always had a way to get what they want um, without um, really consulting with the local communities, but also um, without the local communities benefiting from any of these development projects. But at the end, we're the ones who lose. We're the ones who are facing oppression and um, we are losing, you know, the resources that our region um, holds. Um, so I hope that gave you a little bit of understanding on, on you know, different um, issues surrounding access to water um, for the Uyghur people. Thank you. Uh, Zumrachai, thank you very, very much. Uh, yes, it gave us a lot, a lot of uh, insights. I see also on the Facebook Live, you force people to think. They are sharing their stories from South Africa and from Ghana. Um, 
please go on sharing those uh, voices and perspectives from different countries are very important for us in MRG and we are happy to follow up on on your reflections. Um, so from Zoom Retai, we will move to Mercy Ati. Uh, we will move to Nigeria. Uh, Mercy, are you with us? Can you hear me? Yeah, Anne, thank you so much for uh, you. and and to all the members of the panel. A uh, big thank you to Nick for inviting me to tell the story, for giving me the opportunity. I I am from the Niger Delta, but I am not Ogoni. Um, so my um, involvement or my connection with the Ogoni people is with uh, the late Ken Sarawiwa. Um, I worked for years as a as a journalist in Nigeria, and and because of that, I interacted quite a num you know regularly with him. Uh, he was involved with the Nigerian Association of uh, Authors, and um, and I had opportunity to interview him many times when he launched his books. And my last encounter with him remains one of the most painful experiences that I've had as a journalist. It was at a conference, and I interviewed him, and it was about... Um, the organization that he started mobilizing people for the survival of Ogoni people due to what was going on in Ogoni land. And I asked him if the cause was worth dying for. And he said yes, that it was worth dying to defend his people, to defend his land. And I just said to him, whatever you do, please don't die. And we laughed over it. And a few years later, he was killed for defending, for defending the rights of his people. So that's how I got involved and got interested in the Ogoni people. And when Nick invited me to write about the water crisis, and I thought of the Ogoni, because, I mean, it, we all know that water is life. And one of the things that struck me during the COVID pandemic was, you know, wash your hands, wash your hands. Every 25 minutes, wash your hands. And where people, people who live in a, in a location, in a place where they take water for granted, just think, oh, it's no big deal. But if somebody had trekked for hours to collect water in a jerry can, maybe at most 50 liters of water, walked all the way back, and you expect that person to let family members to wash their hands every you know, 25 minutes or one hour, whatever. No, the choice is not that simple. Nigeria has no problem with, I mean, it, we are surrounded with water. We have a long coastline. We have rivers, creeks, streams, but the poverty when it comes to water is just staggering. And some, just because of poor infrastructure, we don't have that. But what makes your Ogoni situation heartbreaking is that that problem, that lack of water, is the outcome of oil production process. It's what was supposed to make their lives better has actually ended up causing them more problems. So you have a situation where a land that was rich was a food basket where people could just walk to the creeks, to the rivers, to catch fish for dinner for whatever meal, that those people now, due to pollution, such extensive pollution, groundwater polluted to the extent that even when they make boreholes, the water that they get from boreholes are contaminated. And those people now do not have access to portable water because of oil pollution, because the land is polluted. 
and the degradation of the land has such impact on water resources that they have to buy water and water is packaged in in plastic bags and we call pure water which is a real joke because it's not pure water they have to buy water because of pollution and that was the pollution has been acknowledged as a major problem. United Nations Environmental Program did an assessment of Ogoni land 2009 to 2011, and the report was damning. It was like the pollution was such in, in some places, the water resources were so contaminated beyond healthy standards, safe standards. And the, the oil produced, the the oil companies there are more interested in their profit margins than in the quality of life of the people. Shell in particular, they just have their own community. And they have, and the people are now outsiders. They're now foreigners in their own land. And the lack of water, the level of water pollution is such that the life expectancy of of the Ogoni is very, very low. It's about 40, 45 years. Now the assessment, the UNEP assessment was that they, they, there was a need to clean up the land and that cleaning would take up to 30 to 50 years to do a proper job. And yes, there be some efforts to do it, but it's not been, there's lack of political will to do it. And it's not happening. The, some places have been, they've been attempt to clean up, but the reports that I've had talking to people is that it is so surface cleaning, they're not doing real cleaning. You know, when I talk to um, some Ogoni people for this report, one of the, one, the a number of issues that they raised, one person told me about what life was when he was growing up. His dad, on the way back from the farm, would bring fresh, would stop by the beach to buy fresh fish. So he'll come with fresh fish, will come with fruit and vegetables, and they'll just have, you know, if the joke was, you could even hear the, the fish swimming as you're eating it. <laughs> it was that fresh. And they could go swimming, they could go and play in the, the rivers, they could go to the creeks. It was just a place where you felt safe, provided for. But now when children go swimming in the creeks, in the rivers, they come out coated, crude oil. You collect water from the borehole and leave it in a container. And after a while, there'll be a thick film of crude oil. And so many people losing their livelihood have had to move. They've been displaced, forced to move to other parts of Niger Delta to make a living because they can't depend on fishing. They can't even farm because of what's going on. So a, a land, that is so blessed is it's a large mangrove system, the third largest in the world. It's now considered one of the most degraded places on the planet because of oil pollution. And that has impact on water resources. So it's not just that they don't have access, it's their life that is being threatened because when we think of water as life, we see people who are being threatened. I don't want to make it sound like it's all doom and gloom. There is a glimmer of hope, and that's men, to some extent, the women who are rising up to replant the mangrove, the women who are fighting, finding ways to bring hope. But the extent of degradation and pollution is such that 
It has to be the government. It has to be the state stepping in to be responsible, to be accountable to the people because there's a limit to what they can do. But obviously, because oil is the mainstay of the economy, the state will rather side with the multinationals than defend the people. And so it's a strong, it's, it's an ongoing battle. But because the people are so willing to stand up and speak, I mean, I pay tribute to the women who are involved. Where Matt, one of who contributed to, to this report, is one of those working with a group of women replanting the mangrove. And with that, with that courage, with that strength, with that resilience and tenacity, there is hope. There have been um, some of the projects, the recommendations by UNEP attempt to clean up the land. We are hoping that the government will show some commitment and political will to actually do that. There's been a project to, um, to provide water, provide training programs for young people, for women, um, because people who are desperate do desperate things. So there are people who try to do whatever they can to survive, and all these activities uh, contribute to polluting the land even more. So sometimes almost like, you know this is not good for you, this is not for your benefit, but why are you doing it? But we can understand to some extent that when people are desperate, they'll take the desperate steps and desperate measures because they want some way of surviving and it's really down to survival. So for, for the Ogoni people, the ecological warfare is one that they continue to fight. And but be thankful for the many women who are standing up and want looking for ways to serve their communities. There have been some some breakthroughs in terms of restorative justice. I've talked um, in the report, mentioned in some of the cases where Shell has been, as Ken Sarawiwa said, it will be taken one day to answer, be made to answer for its crime against, against the Ogoni people. There have been a, a number of court cases, um, but they fought back uh, in a way that has ways that denied people their rights and they continue to fight back. But there is hope that more with more and more people speaking up that the Ogoni people will someday regain access or have access to their water systems, to, to, to their land, and to the resources that they were blessed with, that the resources that they should claim their own, that belong to them, but that they've been denied access to those resources. And the resilience group of people, and, and I think uh, the memory of, um, of Ken Sarawiwa's sacrifice, as it were, motivates people to keep standing up, uh, to keep demanding um, their rights. And every time they have the courage to take a case to court, as the, 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 the one uh, the, the earlier this year in, in London, it's an indication that they haven't given up. They keep fighting, they keep battling, and their resilience, I'm hopeful, will pay off someday. Thank you for letting me share that story. Merci. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing all these difficult challenges while having this white, beautiful smile on your face and giving us a, a glimpse of hope at the end. Um, from Nigeria, we will fly to Finland. Um, Ola Anti Elaba, um, our, our colleague and friend, uh, lawyer who used to be very active in the Sami Council. Uh, Ola, tell us, how is the situation in Finland? 
Porra Peevi Puokka ja Good day everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Oulanti Lappa and I'm an indigenous Sami. Uh, Sami uh, people, people's traditional lands are in, in the northern part of Scandinavia and Kola Peninsula area and uh, our traditional lands have been divided by the borders of, of, of the nation states, uh, Finland, Sweden, Norway and, and Russia. And as Anna, Anna mentioned, I I've had uh, have had a hon- honor to to work before with uh, Minority Rights Group International in in other uh, articles which have been handling, for example, uh, mining plants in in Sami Sami area and uh, also the effects of uh, climate change uh, to the traditional Sami livelihoods. Uh, However, this year's article uh, that that, uh, uh, I wrote to to the Year Trends uh, report uh, uh, handled uh, uh, fishing, uh fishing rights and uh, in this case especially salmon fishing and uh, the case study uh was uh, uh, concentrated to to uh, uh important uh salmon uh, salmon fish uh, atlantic salmon fish river in the uh, in the northern part of of, of the sami area in in Finland and and in in Norway, the Tatn River uh, salmon fishing is is kind of the the core element of of uh, uh, and and livelihood of 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 the Samis that are that are living in the Tatn River Valley. And it has been so as as long as we can can remember and and know. Uh, I I can tell a little bit uh, uh, perspective that uh, I I'm myself from a different part of of the Sami region in in Finland in in Enontekijön and and. Uh, of course, uh, fishing in general level is important for most of the Samis, also also the ones which which are more neglected with uh, uh, reindeer herding. But uh, for example, I have uh, myself never done salmon fishing. Uh, but uh, it's of course. Uh, in this case, because that no in the eastern part is is a very very lively uh, and uh, central salmon river. But uh, uh, the issue has been uh, <clears throat> in the last three years in uh, in that no area that uh, uh, the salmon there has been a salmon fishing ban. So uh, it's it's kind of a since 2021 uh, there there has been a total ban and uh, it, it's, it's the situation uh, is the same during this uh, summer uh, there is an uh, an act. Uh, which has been uh, approved by by the parliament uh, th- that uh, there is a temperature provision of, of salmon fishing in the Tatno water body. So this is uh, in in my article. It's it's mostly concentrated on 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 the effects of the ban to. The salmon fishing ban, but then again, also there have been uh, other restrictions for in, uh, fishing in general level 
in the fishing act uh, earlier it 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 used to be so that uh, in the three uh, north most northwest municipalities in in Finland which are in in Sami region there there has been a uh, kind of a uh, free uh, fishing right in in the so-called uh, state uh, administrated uh, fishing waters for for the persons which are registered in in the municipalities and uh, if we go historically back this the ground for this has been the rights the ancient rights of the sami people but of course in 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 the legal uh in in the earlier act it it has been a kind of a fishing fishing right uh, for everyone who is registered in, in the municipality, but this this also this kind of general fishing rights in so-called state waters has also been restricted, and it it has it has uh, led to to uh, the situation that uh, uh, Sami peoples have been prosecuted if they are uh, uh, being done fishing in in uh, in some rivers uh, of which for example are are the in a valley of 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 of, of the, uh, or the or or are in the for example in the Dan water course so uh, so there are two kind of uh, aspects in in this article and uh, well, in regard of the the salmon fishing, it's uh, I I had a chance to interview an elder uh, because, as I already told, I'm not an expert in salmon fishing issues. But I had an honor to to uh, interview an uh, an elder Sami salmon fisher uh, who told me uh, who was very worried about the <coughs> effects of the salmon fishing ban. Because there, for example, youth persons don't have now uh, opportunity to learn the traditional salmon fishing uh, met methods, and, uh, uh, and 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 he was worried that there is uh, uh, that there the younger generation will be excluded from from salmon salmon uh, fishing. And uh, and of course uh, it's uh, also also there is the situation that uh, uh, Salomon fishing the the ban is is targeted on 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 the Tetno area, but then again there is a uh, uh, there is um, in the in the sea area uh, there there are uh, uh, no uh, well there is not not a ban of of salmon fishing so so there is a possibility to to fish in the sea seaside so it is it is also kind of a, uh, in a way uh, it's there he he according to him there is no don't no logic on, on, on the restrictions and uh, also so this is uh this is of of course the the issue on on, on salmon fishing and then i also also brought out in my in my article uh uh, uh, court cases uh, when when Samis have uh, have been uh, um, prosecuted uh, to to uh, when they have been uh, fishing in in uh, in rivers in 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 their their home rivers, but uh, uh, and and these cases went to the. Supreme Court, 
Uh, however, the 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 Supreme Court in in this case uh, considered that uh, because, as I already told, the the persons who were fishing in in the in the water course they should have had uh, according to the act a uh, fishing permit but uh, according to the supreme court uh, the the provision uh, would, would have been in obvious conflict with the with the indigenous sami rights that are are recognized in the constitution of of uh, finland uh, samis are recognized as uh, indigenous people in in the constitution of, of finland and uh, fi- reindeer herding fishing and hunting are on uh, part of the sami sami uh, indigenous rights cultural rights so so the supreme court uh, 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 in, in in their judgment uh, uh, ruled that the provision of the fishing act was 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 left uh, disapplied under the constitution and, and and the charge of illegal fishing was was uh, dismissed in in this case so this this was a big big victory for for the sami sami uh, rights fishing rights and and not only only the fishing rights but the, the sami's uh right right to to their their uh language and and culture and and all all the complete uh way of life ola i'm sorry i will have to stop you very soon uh yeah i'm actually coming to an an end of of uh, my my presentation and uh and there is still uh, i can just tell uh, that there is still uh, uh the in a general level of course how to to implement the supreme court decision in in the acts of uh for example fishing act so this this is an this is an issue to be solved in in the future but thank you for for listening and uh, and uh, and uh, and i encourage encourage you to read the whole the whole minority trends report 2023 thank you thank you kitos thank you very much uh, i think for all those who would like to know a bit more about those uh, salmon stories and court cases. Uh, I, I would like to send you to the to the report. The report is already online. Um, Minorityrights.org/slash/trends2023. You had an opportunity to hear four of our authors. There is around what 35, 40 of the authors in this year's report. So you can only imagine how interesting and valuable it is after listening to the to the four speakers. When you go online, you will also be able to see how our report looks like, uh, what is the cover page of the report. And I will just give voice for a moment to Miriam, my colleague from the communications team, to tell you how did it happen that we have such a beautiful cover this year. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining, whether you're a speaker or in the audience. I'm just going to try and share my screen so that you don't have to look at me. And instead, you can look at this beautiful photo, which I'm hoping everyone can see. Yes. Um, So these reports are really central to our work as an organization. I believe MRG actually wrote reports before it did anything else. And photography has always played a really huge part of that um, in terms of making minorities and indigenous peoples not only heard, but also seen. Um, And we know that 
when people are able to represent themselves and tell their own stories, um, the results can be really quite different from when other people tell their stories for them. And it's so important um, to do what you can to put the balance back um, so that people are, are telling their own stories um, at you know local, national and, and the international stages um, because the support is truly global. Um, it's our calling card as an organization. We use it throughout the year and it gets read at the, you know, at the highest levels and, you know, in the communities at the very local level where the case studies originate from. Um, so we felt that this year we wanted to use this opportunity, um, of the cover photo to widen the pool of, um, minority and indigenous photographers that we're in contact with. Um, because we know the world is a very big place, but it's not always possible to know what someone's identity is. So it's not always possible to know even whether you're working with a minority or indigenous photographer. Um, so we wanted to have a call to hopefully have people come to us. Um, so there was, yeah, the only, that was the only real stipulation in terms of entry was self-identifying as minority and indigenous and, um, the entrants were judged by a panel of expert judges in the photography and human rights world. And this is the result. Um, this is a photo from the Philippines uh, by a photographer named Elaine Inlab. Um, I'm sorry, she's not with us today, but I think I really couldn't have imagined a more perfect photo for this report, just to share a bit about um, the story behind the image. Um, the algae that these children are swimming in is is caused by climate change and pollution. Um, and yet it's such a beautiful, stunning, joyful image that really offers hope. And sometimes I think in the human rights world, NGO world, um, images can often be quite gloomy. Um, and I think it's important to show joy um, as much as we're showing. Uh, the more negative things, which are obviously as important. Um, and so I'm so pleased we were able to use Elaine's photo for the cover photo. Um, and I really encourage you all to read um, a little bit more about her in the section of the report where my colleagues Samwit and I discuss in a little bit more detail um, our decision to run this competition and Elaine's own story and style as a photographer. And I think I am. Well, I don't know how to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> That's all for me. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you. As as we see, uh, what reflects every everything that we see around us, and we could hear a lot of sad, difficult things that are around us. But um, we don't want to leave you with this <laughs> with this heavy negative feeling because there is a lot that can be done. And this is what we also always try to include in our MRG's reports. So I will still give floor for a moment to Nick to tell us a bit what can be done. What are our recommendations for the government, companies, UN agencies, NGOs, and all of you out there? Thank you, Anna. I'll be very brief because I think uh, a lot has been said, but I, I encourage everyone here to go to the report and read our recommendations in length. Um, so the report includes uh, recommendations to governments based on the stories, the insights, the wisdoms that um, feature in this report. Um, the recommendations also include uh, key uh, insights um, and musts to companies, um, particularly those, as Sumritai mentioned, that are involved in the extractive mass scale destruction of um, local communities, and also uh, Mercy made this point. And finally, we have a, a list of recommendations for UN agencies, international financial institutions, and other international and regional organizations. Um, and as Sumritai mentioned, there's a lot of um, um, implication of the international financial system and banking system in, in what is known as the water crisis because the large infrastructures, the large corporations are funded by banks in Europe, Asia and, and the UK. So we feel that 
everybody has a stake, everybody has a responsibility, every, everyone has a role to play, whether you are a corporation, a government, uh, an NGO, or indeed an individual. And the report finishes with a pledge that um, I was really privileged to witness um, during my visit to the United Na Nations earlier this year. We, I attended the water conference. The United Nations, if in case you, you didn't know, uh, named 2023 as the year of water and called a water conference for the first time since 1977, which is partly why we chose the theme of water. But in, in that event, I was... Um, privileged to be invited by Rajendra Singh, the waterman of India, to write a, a list of pledges of what every single one of us can do to take action. Um, and I finish with this. The action is not something that we have to delay and wait for. It is not an action that is going to happen because some government somewhere out there is going to miraculously change. It, but it is something that every single one of us can put into, into place through the way we live and the way we connect and the way we take responsibility and gain a sense of reciprocity with the water inside of us and also the water uh, around us. So I encourage you, please, to read that pledge and to sign it as an act of commitment to change. Um, water is our currency for life, not money, nor political power, nor anything as abstract as that. Water is our currency for life. And if we lose sight of that currency for life, um, we know what's going to happen. I don't need to stress it again. Uh, I think this report is as vivid a portrayal of that as we could. Um, like I said, we have tried as much as possible to provide a space to amplify the voices of those who matter the most, women, children, people with disabilities, um, uh, and, and different so-called minorities, as I was clearly uh, pointed out by Sumratai, most of the people that are named minorities don't actually call themselves minorities. It's just people. But these people are at the forefront of this water crisis and their voices matter. They matter not only because of um, their own rights, but also because their knowledges are the solutions to, to, to the dilemma. Um, so with great sort of humility, I encourage you to read to deepen your understanding of indigenous and minority wisdoms and to hopefully begin a process of transformation in your own lives to sort of come closer to those indigenous wisdoms or minority wisdoms in whatever way you can so you can implement change in the way you live. I, I don't want to go into detail into what that means because that's such a long process, but every one of us has a role to play. We're all consuming water. We're all buying water. We're, we're all wasting water. We're all taking water for granted, at least many people in the cities. And uh, listening to these voices is one way to raise a, a planetary consciousness that is much needed to achieve water action and above all water justice, which is what we really want. And that's the big message, the positive message of this report. At the end of all this, there's a real process to enact water justice. And these are the voices that are championing that process the loudest. So please read our recommendations, please sign the pledge. And again, if there's anything about this report or the process of the authors or anything that you need clarification with or you want to learn more about, get in touch with us. We're open um, and we're hoping to keep fighting this, this cause. Uh, it is a year report, but it, uh, it is clear that this issue is not going to go away. And 2024 is not going to be a year where this is going to be resolved. This, this is a fight. Um, that will carry on for, for the rest of our lives. And we're, we're here to sort of support that in any way possible. So thank you. And like I said, please, please do go to the recommendations and the pledge and sign it. Thank you. So first of all, read and get informed. Uh, minorityrights.org slash trends 2023. Um, online, people are asking about each of the chapters you were presenting all the chapters out there, um, we will still put links under your comments um, um, on, on Facebook. Um, second thing, join the debate. Uh, don't stop talking about all of it. Um, as MRG, we are organizing few next events to involve also other outdoor speakers of our reports. 
First of all, um, there will be event on the 29th of June in Nairobi. If anybody here is joining us from Kenya, please get in touch. I, I will be very happy to send you more information about it. The next event will be on the 5th of July in, in Budapest. This will focus more on Roma situation and water in the region. The next set event, 21st July, Water Justice in Americas. We will have speakers from Paraguay, Belize, um, um, Colombia, Mexico. This event will be also in Spanish. It will be mainly in Spanish with translation to English. And we are preparing series of uh, webinars on very concrete of the topics from the report starting after summer together with our friends from International Rivers. Please stay uh, informed. We will, we will send information about all of it very, very soon. Mm, and well, the most important uh, include voices of people on the ground of the minorities because there is absolutely no way to discuss all of it without, without you guys, dear speakers who are joining us here. Thank you so much for your time. Um, MRG is always very happy to put in touch the audience, journalists, politicians with all our friends and partners. Uh, we are there to help. Um, please contact us with any other question. Thank you, everybody, very, very, very much. Have a good day, afternoon, evening, night, depending or of, of where you are. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.